Psalm 119, we'll be picking up in verse 105. 105, and we'll be looking at verses 105 through 112, Psalm 119. Now, you know that uh, kind of working our way through, through uh, these, these, um, these psalms here, uh, remember that Psalm 119 as a whole, that that's entire psalm is talking about the Word of God. So uh, there's so much that the psalmist has, has really taken you know, in it. And, you know, as I was looking at this psalm, there's 176 verses in this psalm. And as we've noted before, that all but five of these psalms, all of them have a reference to the Word of God. Every single verse has a reference to the Word. So 171 verses out of the 176 verses of the psalm here refer to the Word of God. Now, you know, we often hear people say, man, I can just talk on and on and on about Jesus. But when you look at this psalm in its entirety, the psalmist is just going on and on and on about the Word of God. And this really, as we look at this, you know, you're always trying to find different things to kind of pull out of the teaching. But technically, he's talking about the same thing. The context is the word of God. And so there's aspects that we will pull out and um, then we can kind of apply some application. But he's just talking about the word of God. And how important God's word is for our lives. And that's the emphasis of Psalm 119. 176 verses dedicated to this very thing. And, and keep in mind, too, that every verse is not just, you know, him repeating himself. There is really heartfelt connection. The psalmist is expressing his love for God by his love for the word of God. And so... You could tell how much someone truly loves the Lord by how much they love the Word of God. And that's a very important thing. It's not about the knowledge. Notice that the psalmist here in Psalm 119, he's not coming with any, you know, type of apologetics or theology or interpretation. He's not interpreting passages. You know, some people that, that have a love for God's Word, they have this vast knowledge of the Bible and, and historical settings, and, and they're able to debate, and they, they have an apologetics bent on it. Some are very good in eschatology, and, and we go and we follow these people wherever they're teaching. Well, they're the expert on, on the end times, right? Well, just think about this guy. I mean, how popular would he be at a conference today? Probably not too popular. Probably not too popular. Because he's speaking the same thing. He's not coming with any insight other than the need for God's word in our own personal lives. He's not saying the need for you to understand doctrine or theology. He's not saying the need for you to understand apologetics or eschatology, the teaching of the end times or the defending of the faith. He's saying that your soul is in dire need of God's word. It nourishes it saves, it restores. He'll even say in these verses, revives. He's saying that the word of God is the remedy. It's the remedy that fixes the soul that needs help. And his emphasis is just very simple. And you know, sometimes it's in the simplicity of the word of God that we receive the greatest insight the greatest insight into our lives and how we're to live before the Lord. And so we already know that the Psalms are broken up in a series of eight verses after a Hebrew letter. The Hebrew letter tonight is the Hebrew letter noon, like noonday. And as in now, the pronunciation is noon. So let's all repeat. Say it. Noon. There's your Hebrew letter. This is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So when they ask you, what did you do tonight at church? Say, you know, I, I spoke a little bit of Hebrew. Yeah? What did you learn? Noon. Or you can say nanya. Never mind. You guys know what that means. No. Noon. Here's the Hebrew letter, noon. Now, listen. Look at this now. He goes on to say in these next verses, really, what the letter in itself means. Because the letter, noon, in the Hebrew alphabet, guys, listen. The picture is like of a seed springing forth. That's the picture of it. The idea behind the symbolism of the letter Nun, the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is equivalent to its numerical value of 50, 
which has great significance with the giving of the law and the children of Israel in the wilderness. There's great significance to this number. Fifty years, then comes the year of Jubilee. So, so it has a timing in it that is important to the Hebrew people, but it also has a picture of faithfulness and the reward for faithfulness. That's the picture of it. Faithfulness and the reward for faithfulness. And in a sense, you can see the point that he will probably bring out in these next couple of verses is it is in regards to the word of the Lord. Now, remember that in the Hebrew language, the word therefore word is the Hebrew word debar. Everybody say debar. That's the word word in the Hebrew. Now, what's important about this word is it's different. Say, for instance, in the Greek, we use words like rhema. Uh, remember there the story in Luke's gospel. Yesterday at our men's breakfast, we read the account of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. And then as he's expressing to Mary that all these wonderful things are going to happen and in her will be conceived by the Spirit of the Lord, the Messiah, the Mashiach of Israel, right? And then she says, let it be so according to your word. The Greek word there is the Greek word rhema. Let it be according to your rhema. And then you have the Bible in John chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the word. Well, that's not the Greek word rhema. It's the Greek word logos. And so you have this type of a picture with the word throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, rhema is the spoken word and logos is the living word. And, and there is matter to that. It's, it's, it's pretty important to kind of consider what John is speaking about when he says in the beginning was the word. He's kind of setting some things apart so that they can understand basically the idea and the point that he's making with these words. Now, when you look at all of this here, you'll see that the Logos is really the word and the idea behind it is a principle or a thought. And it's important to just know that that's the word that he used for this because he could have used any other word, but he's emphasizing something here. And so when you look at this, when he says in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was this principle or this thought. You see, the Hebrew word debar in the Hebrew mind, the word has weight and it has substance and matter to it. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew language, the word debar, when you speak a word to someone, it's as if you're giving them something. It's not just a word. It's a matter. It's weighty. It has substance to it. This, I believe, is the same idea. The same idea. This is why you see so much in the Old Testament, the name of a person meaning so much. That there's weight behind their name. Vows being made to the Lord should be made in a way in which we are to revere God's word. We're to honor the vows we make to the Lord. Because it's our word to the Lord. It's our debar to the Lord. When we give a word to the Lord and say, God, I commit, I vow this, there should be weight, there should be matter, it should be substance, it should be the very thing in which it could be trusted. God's word can be trusted. Now, when you look at in John chapter 1, and John uses the word logos, now, Jesus is the Logos, is what we see here. There's, there's no doubt about that. But, but notice what he's doing here. You see, in the Greek language and to the church, the word Logos means this very word, this principle or this thought, with the idea behind it of weight and matter. In Greek philosophy, the word Logos doesn't mean that. It means divine reason. And it's interesting because you have divine reason or it also means the mind of God. Could it be that John, appealing to a Greek culture, the New Testament written in Greek, using the word logos for the purpose of stating here that the logos in the beginning was the logos and the word was with God and the word was God. And so we see here that he's emphasizing who this Logos is, 
And this word is the divine reason, the mind of God. Perhaps that could be the very weight behind it because it holds that very same substance of the Hebrew word debar, matter, substance. So when you look at this here, the psalmist is starting off and he's saying your word, your debar, a matter of a thing. You know what else it means? It means a course or an act. That would imply that the word debar in the Hebrew mindset is that the word is alive. And isn't that what the Bible says? It's a common understanding that the word of God is alive. It's not just a system of words or a phrase, but it truly is a word that is alive. So the psalmist will walk us through this kind of picture. I think it's important for us to consider this. But look at what he goes on to say now. Look at verse 105. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Notice the word lamp and light. They're, they're consistent, meaning the same thing, correct? Now, um, when we go to Israel, there's a place called uh, Nazareth Village. Um, who, who here has been to me with Israel and we've gone to Nazareth Village? Okay, so you guys, yeah. I, I was trying to think about that. When you leave Nazareth Village, they give you these little tiny lamps. And, and they're made out of clay. And, and inside of them is a little, a little wick. And you put oil in the little lamp. And that's, it's the actual size. That's a real lamp. That's what they would carry around. They have a little handle on them. You can kind of slip your finger. It has oil. You light the, you light the wick because there's oil in it. It's a small. You could fit it in the palm of your hand. I have one at home. I was going to bring it. I was going to set it right here. I was going to raffle it off for like 200 bucks. Anyways, <laughs> it's going to sign it in everything. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but but I, I, I have a couple of them at home because I've been to Nazareth Village a couple of times. And so, you know, I, we, you know we just have a couple of lamps there. Now, this, these are the lamps that, think about this, this is what they would use to walk around. They didn't have lighting like we have lighting here. But this is what they had. They had these lamps. And remember that the lamp would only illuminate as far out as that light from the fire, that flame, would project. So it won't light the whole room, but it'll light the path before you as you're taking a step. It's constantly lighting your path. Think about this. So that would mean this. If you're in a large enough room, you can't see the whole room, but you can see your path clearly. There's no obstacles in your way because this lamp has lit your path, but everything around you is dark. That's the picture of where we are today. It's been said that we are living in an age of enlightenment, but no, we're not. We're living in an age of darkness. And the only enlightenment today is not found in the wisdom or the philosophies of man, but it's found in the teaching of God's word. And you see that this very word is this little lamp in this dark world as we take these steps and we do move forward. And listen, so many people say, oh, come and you'll be enlightened. I mean, just, just Google the word enlightened. See what type of stuff comes up. You'd be blown away. You'd be surprised. And then there are those that will also take the Bible and, and, and begin to use that as if there's other things to gain from it. Come and gain some enlightenment from the word of God. Well, yeah, there is, but the psalmist keeps it very simple. Let me, let me kind of just throw it to you. You know what I was thinking about the other day? You know, I am a guy who... Um, when I study a book of the Bible, I, I read the book. Um, there are many what we would call um, Bible handbooks. A Bible handbook emphasizes and focuses in its context um, the author, uh, the, the readers, um, dates, times. It's, it's more of your, like, I guess you could say academic textbook to the Bible, okay? So you, you're kind of sitting in class studying a book, so to speak, about the book of the Bible, right? And so there are many Bible handbooks, one very popular. We have it in our small little book nook back there. It's called Haley's Bible Handbook. It's a very easy read. It's not really practical in the sense of Bible teaching, but you could actually teach to a degree academically through the Bible with this Bible handbook. So those are fine. You know, there are many of them. 
Wilmingtons, uh, MacArthur's, Haley's. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of them. And um, then you got what are called commentaries. And commentaries are another man's comments on verses of the books of the Bible. And when I am studying a new book of the Bible, I will read it a couple of times for my own read. And what I do first is I read different translations. So I will get, uh, let's say, a translation that is very easy to read. The New Living Translation, very easy read. And I'll read it a couple of times in that. I'll read it in the New King James because this is what I teach out of. And I do all this to become familiar with the text. But in going back and forth, there are what are called parallel Bibles. And parallel Bibles have four or five different translations. So you open up the book of the, of, of the parallel Bible, and it'll have the King James translation, the NLT, the NIV, the NASB, you know, uh, the Amplified. And then you just open it up to Psalm 119, and it'll give you that verse in all those different translations. And so I... We'll read it that way, too, just to get some clarity on the passage. Then I'll grab a couple of commentators. That, and when I say a couple, maybe I'm, I'm lying to you. Yeah, I am lying to you. I'll probably grab about 10 commentators or 15 on the topic, and most of them written from the 1800s. And I'll tell you, one verse or two verses is probably like a chapter or two of that whole book. And... You read, and, you know, you never stop learning, right? Well, I was just looking at this the other day, and I says, how many commentaries did the author of Psalm 119 have? How many Bible handbooks did he have? How, how many of these resources to help study the Word of God did he have? None but the Holy Spirit. And he's just constantly sharing his heart about his experience with God's word. Now, I thought to myself, you know, guys, and that's just part of it. The Bible, you know, you say, well, how do you know about the end times? Well, not every book on the Bible or commentary will teach you about the end times. There's some commentators that won't even, you know what, there's commentators that don't even write commentaries on the book of Revelation. And they're scholars, so you got to, then that's a whole nother system in itself. You got to find all the guys that teach about the end times. And then you got to start reading that stuff. Hey, you could study the word of God until he comes back or he takes you home and you won't even scratch the surface. That's the truth. But as I started to look, you know, just the other day, I says, you know, Lord, I want to love your word like the psalmist loved your word. And the reality is the Lord just says, just read my word. Just, just get into it and, and, and read it and, and take it in. And it's not that there's anything wrong with reading all this other stuff, but they didn't have it. Their love came from a pure relationship with the word of God. And so the psalmist here is saying that this word and this alone, it wasn't commentaries that enlightened him in the word of God. It wasn't the Logos Bible software that you spend eight, nine hundred dollars on. That didn't, it didn't cost him money to be enlightened in the word of God. Now, God bless you if you purchased it and if you have a free download, shoot it over here. I've never bought it, but I wouldn't mind using it. But... <laughs> But I get all that, all that's fine. I get that. I get it. I get it. I get it. But just think about it. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet. How would he know that God's word is a lamp to his feet? How would he know? Listen to this, guys. Your word, your debar, your matter of a thing or course or act is a lamp to my feet. In other words, your word keeps me from what? Stumbling. 
Your word keeps me from stumbling. It illuminates my path. Look at what he says, and a light. It's a light to my path. Now, the word path is also synonymous with the word life. My way, my life, my path. Okay? We see that in verse 32 of Psalm 119, verse 35 in Psalm 119, verse 101. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your Word, it has to do with how one is living. It pertains to his life. Verse 128 in Psalm 119. In Psalm chapter 23 in verse 3. And Psalm 25 in verse 4. The same thing. Well, now the psalmist is giving us an understanding about the very word of God. That he, he's saying here that the word of God is the very thing that keeps him, the faithfulness that he is speaking about here of God's word. Well, faithfulness is the evidence of faith. He's saying that his life has been on a consistent path because of the faithfulness of God's word, and he is able to demonstrate faith because of faithfulness. So let me give you this thought, please. Faithfulness is a evidence of faith. Did you know that? That's what Romans chapter 10 in verse 17 says, that faith comes by and hearing of the 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 13 declares the very same thing. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And, and what begins to happen is, is a life of faithfulness walking in the Lord. So he's saying that it enlightens us. Psalm 100, and, or excuse me, Psalm 19, excuse me, in verse 8. I was going to say 119, but it's Psalm 19 in verse 8. Declares the very truth of God's word being that light that illuminates our lives. It illuminates our lives. Your life is illuminated by the word of God. What's the benefit of your life being illuminated by God's word? What is the benefit? It casts out darkness from our lives. Oh, yes, we just said here that it has been said, we've heard it said, I, most of us, I believe, that we live in an age of enlightenment, but we really don't, right? We live in an age of what? Darkness. And the word of God... The Bible that we hold in our hands today has become that little lamp that illuminates every step that we take in a dark and fallen world. And so the word helps us. It helps all of us to follow the right path. The word of God helps us to follow the right path. Put that in your notes there. You see, in 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says it not only enlightens our lives, but it enlightens our lives, and there's going to be a day of consummation with that enlightenment. Notice what it says here, uh, Peter's epistle in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says this in verse 19. He says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, listen to this, as a light that shines in a dark place. The light that shines in a dark place, the context is the word of God, the prophetic and confirmed word of God, meaning the word of God is prophetic. And this is why sometimes people get on this trip, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a prophet. No, proper interpreting scripture, the prophetic scripture, there's still much of scripture that is prophecy. That is exercising the gift of prophecy, speaking God's word. You're not declaring no new light. You're just further confirming the light that has already been given. That's why every new movement or age that starts and they say, well, we have new enlightenment, stay away from it. Because light attracts. I mean, I mean, look at, look at the mosquitoes and flies. You know, it's like you turn a light on there, then things are buzzing all around it like crazy. I mean, that's, it, it could be used as, as an attracting thing, but it could also bring about death to these mosquitoes. You know, you get one of those zapper lights. All you hear is, bzz, bzz, that's it, gone just got zapped. 
But listen to this. He goes on to say here, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Listen to this. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. You see, so the word is light and truth. It's what it is. It's light and it's truth. And so point being made is that we see that the word of God doesn't need us to explain it. It needs us to obey it. It needs us to obey it. Verse 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, the important thing about that is you got so many people that want to say what the Bible means. But you can never get away from the context of Scripture. Yeah, you can hyper-spiritualize things and make it sound all mystical as if there is some other thing behind it. But that's not the way God operates. The only mysteries of the Scriptures have already been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The mystery is out. That's it. It was fulfilled in Christ. And any time we see the word mysteries in the Bible, it always pertains to Jesus Christ prior to his first advent. And now that he's here, the mystery is out. It's Christ. And so this is why Jude says in chapter 1 of Jude in verse 3, that this is the faith that has once and for all been delivered unto the saints. So the completeness of the word, the fullness of the word, the faithfulness of the word keeps us from falling and stumbling in darkness. The word helps us follow the right path. That's what verse 130 of Psalm 119. How many of you guys want to walk the right path? Look, look at what it says here. How, how, many, how many of you here would say you're a pretty simple person? Don't ask somebody next to you if you are, okay? Listen, that's, <laughs> they're going to tell you you're not simple. They're going to say, oh, you know, okay. If it makes you feel good to raise your hand, go ahead and raise it. But you're pretty difficult, you know. No, listen. But, but, but here's the point that's being made. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse 130, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Notice that. It gives understanding to the simple. So it causes us to follow the right path. Psalm uh, uh, 18, verse 28, Psalm 18, verse 28, and Psalm 19. These two psalms go hand in hand on, on these verses. Psalm 18, verse 28, and Psalm 19, verse 8. Speak about the word of God keeping us on the right path. Psalm 36 and verse 9. And Psalm 43 and verse 3. Now remember what... Solomon says in the Proverbs, he says it in chapter 6, about the word of God in verse 23, he says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instructions are the way of life. Listen to that. Isn't that a good word? He says, For the commandment is a lamp. This is what the psalmist is saying. It's a lamp. And the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The word of God keeps you on the right path. It, 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 is, it is a corrected path because the word of God is what corrects our path. So when you want to make decisions, always look to God's word. And so here, this is what he's saying as he's laying it out. This is just in verse 105. We're not done. Darkness is all around us. This is why there's a need for the word to be what it is in the psalmist's life, in your life, and in my life. The, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Why? Why do we need the word so much? Because darkness is all around us. John chapter 1 and verse 5. And this, and this word, this logos, right? 
He, he came into this world and, and, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Darkness does not comprehend light. And, and so this is why you need the word of God. This is why the world doesn't understand why you're at Bible study on Sunday night. You know, when you can be catching up on a, I don't know, a Sunday night flick. Or, or you leave all your duties for the Lord's day. And say, I'm too busy for you, Lord. I need to wash clothes and get ready for the week. Well, is it your clothes and your duties that are going to light your path? No, it's not. No, it's not. You, you know, it, it's always that thing. Listen, if you could tell how much someone loves the Lord by how much they love his word. Isn't the psalmist expressing here that there's no other way to live? You got to live in the word of God. John chapter 3 and verse 19. Darkness all around us. We see also in John chapter 8 and verse 12. And in John chapter 12 in verse 46. Colossians chapter 1 in verse 13. And 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. So the word helps us to follow the right path. There is darkness all around us. And here's another point. Jot it down. Obedience to the word keeps us walking in the light. Isn't that what John says in 1 John? You know, when you look at and understand that there is a great need for us to, you know, really walk in the light of God's word. I, I like just the way that John puts it. He says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, well the psalmist is declaring that. He's, he's just sharing it in the context of God's word, Right? If we say that we have fellowship with him, we walk. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Who in here doesn't have sin tonight? Yeah, that's always good to ask after you read that verse. Huh? <laughs> but, but listen to this. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Look at how the word is tied in. How the word of God is tied in to what we say and declare about God and how we live. Notice that. This is why the psalmist is saying that the word of the Lord, it's a weighty matter. It's, 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 your life depends on it. And so, yes, devotionals are good. Read them. But make sure you get the word in and make sure you say, Lord, how can I apply this word to my life today? From the Old to the New Testament, both writers are saying this. Please, church, they're writing this with you in mind. The Lord had you in mind. Listen, if you think tonight, wow, you know, I went to, went to church tonight, and Pastor Dave just really took it home with how important it is. It's not me. It's what the Bible is saying. And if it's said more than one time, if you have to tell somebody more than one time, it's because they're not getting it the first time. And how often does the Lord tell us more than one time in his word? If you've read it long enough, you'll know that he keeps saying it over and over again. Why is that? Has it ever occurred to you? It's, 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 it's so funny. I, I don't know who somebody I was talking to. I talked to so many people and I don't know. It was somebody recently. And they were just kind of like, and, and then I opened the Bible 
and then this verse, and then I heard this teaching on the radio, and then that, then I heard you say what you had to say, and you said this, and they just like walked me through the, hearing the same thing over and over again. And I looked at them and I said, God's confirming it. They're just like, yeah. It's exciting to see them get excited about that that's their moment. God just spoke to you. He's talking to you. So now what you got to do is don't recognize how many times you heard the same thing. Say, okay, Lord, like Samuel said, here I am, Lord. Your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. To obey and to do and to go. So this is what we need. We need God's word in our life. And then look at what he says. He's implying that the believer's life or the person who has a relationship with God's word, his walk is consistent with the enlightening of God's word. The Bible says we become wise by way of the word of God. So all this leads to a great walk with the Lord. That's what it leads to. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, it says we're to walk worthy. Jot that down, worthy. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 2 says that we're to walk upright. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it says we're to walk in the light. And in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says we are to walk humbly. Well, the word of God leads and directs us into that. And he goes on to say in verse 106, he says, I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. Look at the word sworn. I have sworn that I will keep your righteous judgments. Listen to what he's saying here, guys. He's saying, I have sworn, I made a vow. Can I just give you guys just a, a word of wisdom? You ready for this? Be careful with the vows you make to the Lord. Be very careful with the vows you make to the Lord. This is his prayer, and, and, and let me explain something to you. He's, 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 it's not he's reminding the Lord that he made a vow and, and God better keep his part. No, he's saying, Lord, I know that I made a vow to you. Be careful. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 33 through 37, Jesus, out of his own word, says, if you make a vow, you better keep it, not only to the Lord, but even to your neighbors. Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2, the Bible gives great warning about making a vow and not keeping it. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 21. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verses 1 through 7, when one makes a vow, he is to keep it, whether he makes it to the Lord or to his neighbor. And did you know that a vow to your neighbor is a vow unto the Lord? Did you know that? Keep your vows that you make. Keep them. Then he goes on to say this, I am afflicted. This is truthfulness. Say this, guys, listen. Truthfulness is important when you pray. Let me say that again. Truthfulness is important when you pray. Don't be praying something over somebody that you yourself are not doing. Don't lie when you pray. Because to pray what you yourself are not practicing and or what you yourself do not believe is a gross sin before God. Your prayer needs to be truthful. Some people like to pray over people because they feel that perhaps maybe they look spiritual. Be careful. Be very careful. His determination came from a season of afflictions in his life. Notice here, he says, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. What is he saying? I know that your word revives. Revive me according to your word. You know what he's saying? He receives strength and sustenance from the word of God. This is a, this is a, a great relationship with the word of God. And look at what he says here. Revive me according, uh, according to your words, except I pray. Once again, he's emphasizing his prayer that it be truthful, that he keeps his vows. The free will offering of my mouth, O Lord. 
The free will offering was to show love and gratitude and thankfulness, right? Isn't that what the free will offering was? And that's what we're to do in prayer. Psalm chapter 50 in verse 14. Hosea chapter 14 in verses 1 and 2. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. And, and what he's saying here is he's saying, listen, you know, I have kept these vows, Lord, because I, I want to be open and honest before you as I pray. So then he goes on to say, and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, often in danger, like what we read about in Judges chapter 12 and verse 3. In 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 5. Our lives are in danger. Taking our lives in our own hands is the idea behind it, meaning what? That we know that we're living in dangerous times. And it's kind of like, you know, this idea when people get Psalm 23 and it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You've heard that, right? It's in the psalm. And people always think it's talking about somebody dying, walking from this life into eternity. That's not what the psalmist is talking about. It's not a verse that anybody should quote at a funeral. It's not a funeral verse. Every day you and I are walking in death's shadow. We can die at any moment. You today, right now, are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But don't fear no evil, for God is with you. And so this is the point that he's making here. He's saying, my life daily is in danger. Yet I do not forget your law. Think about that. I might have a season of affliction and there might be danger, but I don't forget your law. Your law is the comfort. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Guys, do you see what he's saying here? Nothing is taking me off course from obeying your word and living in your word and applying it to my life. You don't apply God's word to your life when everything's going good. You apply God's word to your life when everything is going good and bad because God's word is not moved by any of it. It is the only solid thing and consistent thing in your life. Can I just give you guys a food for thought, please? Hear me out. This has been the source of my strength in my trial. It's been the word of God. It's been the only thing that has kept me staying the course. Because I believe this more than the reality and the nightmare I've been living for the last year. The nightmare is the reality. But the truth in this reality has been the faithfulness of God's word. Nothing should ever get in the way of who the Lord is. I don't care who it is. Hold on to the Lord. Remain above reproach. Act according to his word. And God will honor it and bless it. There's no doubt about that. Are you okay, pastor? How are you doing? I get that a lot. And they look at me like, I just want to ask you. They start rubbing my back. <laughs> How are you doing? Well, last I checked, the Lord is faithful in his word. Do I have my moments of stretching? stretching? Absolutely. Do I have my moments of sorrow? Of course. Do I have my moments of deep pain? No doubt about it. Do I have my moments of tears? Still to this day, I do. Nothing's changed in this season of affliction as it pertains to pain and sorrow and questions. But the one thing that has remained the same in all of this is the faithfulness of God's word. It's all I can say. It's all I can say. So, when you ask me, how are you doing? And I say, I'm good. I say, I'm good according to his word. Because I am. I can relate to what the psalmist is saying here. 
My life is continually in my hands. I'm afflicted, but yet I do not forget your word. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. How can you smile? How can you laugh? How can you forgive? How can you treat good? The ones or the one that's betrayed you. Because his word is a heritage. This season in your life, church, listen, tonight, in your home, in your finances, will pass. This season of doubt, fear, and confusion that sometimes comes upon us, and distress and anger, and even physical ailments, will pass. All these things have an expiration date, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Nobody likes going through it in the time that we are, but God is faithful. He gets us through it. Amen? Amen. Think about that. This is what he's saying. He's going out with it right here. And he says, your testimonies have taken, I've taken as a heritage forever. The word heritage means inheritance. No turning back. He kind of closes out. For they are rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the... Wow. Look at how he ends this. Guys, man, read this again. You know, get, get a couple of translations. Look at what he says. He talks about God, how amazing his word is, how it is, how it is the very life source of his own life. And then he says, even in times of affliction and despair, even when the wicked have surrounded me, even when people have come against me, whatever his situation and circumstances, we don't know the details, but he's showing his heart and he's saying this, I've made my vows, I've never broke them. Even when times were tough, God, I remain faithful. And he says here, listen, what I've done, rather than lose all heart and say, God, how come you're not helping me in this situation? And this, this is really, really, really tough. No, he's saying, Lord, in the midst of all this adversity, revive me according to your word. Your word promises me that I can be revived in the midst of trials. Do it, Lord. That's what your word says. And then he goes on to say, your word is an inheritance. And look at how he closes it out in verse 112. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes. You know what he's saying? To whom shall I go? You have the words of life. What, am I, what, what else am I going to do? What am I going to do? What are you going to do? It's not like you can fix the situation you're in. Hello? That's the reason why you're in that situation. You got involved with it. We can't fix it, but God can. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. Talk about commitment. To the very end. You know what he's saying? To the very end, I will trust in the word of God. I will walk in the word of God. I will obey the word of God till the very end. Everything within your flesh is saying, give up, give in, say something, do something. Teach people a lesson, walk away. Maybe God will take you serious. When you start thinking those thoughts... It's never been about you having a relationship with the Lord. It's been about you having a relationship with yourself. But when you say, Lord, I have nowhere else to turn, no one else to trust, and no one else to obey but you, now you know who you've been walking with all this time. And say, Lord, revive me according to your word. I have inclined in my heart, I have determined in my heart that I will be faithful to your word till the very end. And you know what, for me, guys, I want to encourage you with this. That's all that really matters to me. That when this trial and any other trial that comes in your life, my life, when it's all said and done, whether people agreed with what you did or didn't do or how you handled it or didn't handle it, and trust me, people will talk because that's what people do. But what matters the most is what God has already spoken in his word and what it says about him and as it pertains to you. Hold on to this. And at the end of the day, if you just obey this, God gets the glory. And isn't all that is what really matters? Absolutely. <laughs>